hated it. Said he wanted this um, stuff. A hundred years ago, a new theory about human nature was put forward by Sigmund Freud. He had discovered, he said, primitive sexual and aggressive forces hidden deep inside the minds of all human beings. Forces which, if not controlled, led individuals and societies to chaos and destruction. This series is about how those in power have used Freud's theories to try and control the dangerous crowd in an age of mass democracy. At the heart of the story is not just Sigmund Freud, but other members of the Freud family. When this episode is about Freud's American nephew, Edward Bernays. Bernays is almost completely unknown today, but his influence on the 20th century was nearly as great as his uncle's. Because Bernays was the first person to take Freud's ideas about human beings and use them to manipulate the masses. He showed American corporations for the first time how they could make people want things they didn't need by linking mass-produced goods to their unconscious desires. Out of this would come a new political idea of how to control the masses. By satisfying people's inner selfish desires, one made them happy and thus docile. It was the start of the all-consuming self which has come to dominate our world today. Freud's ideas about how the human mind works have now become an accepted part of society as have psychoanalysts. Every year, the psychotherapist ball is held in a grand palace in Vienna. This is the psychotherapy ball. Psychotherapists come, some advanced patients come, or former patients come, and many other people, friends, but also um, um, uh, people from the Viennese society who like to go to a nice, elegant, comfortable ball. But it was not always so. A hundred years ago, Freud's ideas were hated by Viennese society. At that time, Vienna was the center of a vast empire ruling Central Europe. And to the powerful nobility of the Habsburg court, Freud's ideas were not only embarrassing, but the very idea of examining and analyzing one's inner feelings was a threat to their absolute control. You see, at that time, these people had the power. And of course, you just were not allowed to show your bloody feelings. I mean, you just couldn't. You know, I mean, you couldn't, if you were unhappy, can you imagine, you, for instance, you sit somewhere in the country in a castle, you are deeply unhappy, you are a woman. I, you couldn't go to your maid and cry on, on her shoulder, so you couldn't go into the village and, and complain, you know, about your feelings. I mean, you couldn't, it, it was like selling yourself to somebody, you just couldn't, you know, because they had to respect you. Now, of course, Freud, you see, put that thought very much into question because you, you see, to examine yourself, you would have to, to put a lot of other things into question, your society, everything but surrounds you. And that wasn't a good thing at that time. Why not? Because your self-created empire, to a certain extent, would have fallen into bits much earlier already. But what frightened the rulers of the empire even more was Freud's idea that hidden inside all human beings were dangerous instinctual drives. Freud had devised a method he called psychoanalysis. 
By analyzing dreams and free association, he had unearthed, he said, powerful sexual and aggressive forces, which were the remnants of our animal past. Feelings we repressed because they were too dangerous. Freud devised a method for exploring a hidden part of the mind, which we nowadays call the unconscious, which is a part that is totally unknown to our consciousness, that there exists a barrier in all our minds which prevents these hidden and unwelcome impulses of the unconscious from emerging. Good night. In 1914, the Austro-Hungarian Empire led Europe into war. As the horror mounted, Freud saw it as terrible evidence of the truth of his findings. The saddest thing, he wrote, is that this is exactly the way we should have expected people to behave from our knowledge of psychoanalysis. Governments had unleashed the primitive forces in human beings, and no one seemed to know how to stop them. At that time, Freud's young nephew, Edward Bernays, was working as a press agent in America. His main client was the world-famous opera singer Caruso, who was touring the United States. La donna immobile, qual più Bernays' parents had emigrated to America 20 years before, but he kept in touch with his uncle and joined him for holidays in the Alps. But Bernays was now about to return to Europe for a very different reason. On the night that Caruso opened in Toledo, Ohio, America announced it was entering the war against Germany and Austria. As a part of the war effort, the US government set up a committee on public information. And Bernays was employed to promote America's war aims in the press. The president, Woodrow Wilson, had announced that the United States would fight not to restore the old empires, but to bring democracy to all of Europe. And Bernays proved extremely skillful in promoting this idea, both at home and abroad. And at the end of the war, he was asked to accompany the president to the Paris Peace Conference. Then, to my surprise, they asked me to go with, with Woodrow Wilson to the peace conference. And at the age of 1926, I was in Paris for the entire time of the peace conference that was held in the suburb of Paris. And we worked to make the world safe for democracy. That was a big slogan. Wilson's reception in Paris astounded Bernays and the other American propagandists. Their propaganda had portrayed Wilson as a liberator of the people, a man who would create a new world in which the individual would be free. They had made him a hero of the masses. And as he watched the crowd surge around Wilson, Bernays began to wonder whether it would be possible to do the same type of mass persuasion, but in peacetime. When I came back to the United States, I decided that if you could use propaganda for war, you could certainly use it for peace. And propaganda got to be a bad word because of the Germans using it. So what I did was to try to find some other words. So we found the word Council on Public Relations. Bernays returned to New York and set up as a public relations council in a small office off Broadway. It was the first time the term had ever been used. Since the end of the 19th century, America had become a mass industrial society, with millions clustered together in the cities. 
Bernays was determined to find a way to manage and alter the way these new crowds thought and felt. To do this, he turned to the writings of his uncle Sigmund. While in Paris, Bernays had sent his uncle a gift of some Havana cigars. In return, Freud had sent him a copy of his general introduction to psychoanalysis. Bernays read it, and the picture of hidden irrational forces inside human beings fascinated him. He wondered whether he might make money by manipulating the unconscious. What Eddie got from Freud was indeed this idea that there is a lot more going on in human decision making, not only among individuals, but even more importantly among groups, than this idea that information drives behavior. And so Eddie began to formulate this idea that you had to look at things that would play to people's irrational emotions. And you see, that moved Eddie immediately into a different category from other people in his field and most government officials and managers of the day who thought if you just hit people with all this factual information, they would look at that and say, oh, of course. And Eddie knew that was not the way the world worked. Bernays set out to experiment with the minds of the popular classes. His most dramatic experiment was to persuade women to smoke. At that time, there was a taboo against women smoking, and one of his early clients, George Hill, the president of the American Tobacco Corporation, asked Bernays to find a way of breaking it. He said, we're losing half of our market because men have invoked the taboo against women smoking in public. Can you do anything about that? I said, let me think about it. And then I said, have I your permission to see a psychoanalyst to find out what cigarettes mean to women? He said, what'll it cost? So I called up Dr. Brill, A.A. Brill, who was a leading psychoanalyst in New York at that time. How come you didn't call your uncle? Why didn't you call your uncle? Because he was in Vienna. A. A. Brill was one of the first psychoanalysts in America. And for a large fee, he told Bernays that cigarettes were a symbol of the penis and of male sexual power. He told Bernays that if he could find a way to connect cigarettes with the idea of challenging male power, then women would smoke because then they would have their own penises. Every year, New York held an Easter Day parade to which thousands came. And Bernays decided to stage an event there. He persuaded a group of rich debutantes to hide cigarettes under their clothes. Then, they should join the parade, and at a given signal from him, they were to light up the cigarettes dramatically. Bernays then informed the press that he had heard that a group of suffragettes were preparing to protest by lighting up what they called torches of freedom. He knew this would be an outcry, and he knew that all of the photographers would be there to capture this moment. And so he was ready with a phrase which was torches of freedom. And so here you have a symbol, women, young women, debutantes, smoking a cigarette in public with a phrase that means anybody who believes in this kind of equality pretty much has to support them in the ensuing debate about this because torches of freedom. I mean, what's on all American coins? It's liberty. She's holding up the torch. You see, and so all of this is there together. There's emotion, there's memory, there's a rational phrase. Even though it's using a lot of emotional elements, it's a, it's a phrase that works in a rational sense. Uh, all of this is together. And so the next day, this was not just in all of the New York papers, it was across the United States and around the world. And from that point forward, uh, the sale of cigarettes to women 
began to rise. He had made them socially acceptable with a single symbolic act. What Bernays had created was the idea that if a woman smoked, it made her more powerful and independent, an idea that still persists today. Embrace me, my sweet embrace. It made him realize that it was possible to persuade people to behave irrationally if you link products to their emotional desires and feelings. The idea that smoking actually made women freer was completely irrational, but it made them feel more independent. It meant that irrelevant objects could become powerful emotional symbols of how you wanted to be seen by others. Eddie Bernays saw the way to sell product was not to sell it to your intellect, that you ought to buy an automobile, but that you will feel better about it if you have this automobile. I think he originated that idea that they weren't just purchasing something, but they were engaging themselves emotionally or personally in, in, in the product or service. That it's not, you, you think you need a new piece of clothing, but you'll feel better with the piece of clothing. That was his contribution in a very real sense. We see it all over the place today, but I think he originated the idea of the emotional connect to a product or service. Mm -hmm.